So there's nothing morally or legally contradictory about this strategy of assigning rights to nature or granting non-human subjects rights since we do this all the time to other non-human subjects like corporations. Now, which rights in particular? Well, most important right of all, right? Property rights. So the right to own itself, that is a river, a mountain, a species of wild boar, or swamp land to be an owner of itself. All these natural goods to be easily conceptualized as owners of themselves, even using the standards of subjective rights to private law. Lawyers have been doing this for 50 years, especially since Christopher Stone's classic article from 1972 on whether trees have standing. But it's not just environmental lawyers that do this. The idea of rights of nature or of self-ownership of nature has much deeper roots in indigenous communities and cosmologies worldwide, especially in the ecological religious concepts of Pachamama, of Wendy Beer, Tao Kua, and others. Now these are usually tied to particular religious, metaphysical, and epistemological perspectives on the nature of the universe, on the ultimate sources of being and life, on the role of human beings as caregivers, and also on particular conceptions of time, seasonality, cyclicality, uh, for instance, among the Quechua, Aymara, and Maori people. These, concept, these concepts have been used in various contexts to assign legal rights to natural objects, such as rivers and forests in Ecuador and New Zealand and many more. Now, the liberal or the non-metaphysical version of this thesis does um, not base itself on these indigenous cosmologies, right? But on the epistemological framework of modern law itself, private law. So, Private property rights are the most valued right in liberal capitalist societies, then it is these property rights which have to stand up to the claims of others. This means using property rights against property rights, right? This is what Tina will talk about. Um, so to stop like a mining company from going into a forest with their property rights, you have to have the property rights in the forest against the mining company. This is the idea. Um, and, and this is the hope, I think, of rights of nature, that you know, we can't fight property rights with call to environmental care, we need something enforceable. I'll also give two quick problems with this, and uh, the version I'm, the, the right nature of thesis I'm talking about is a very limited one, so it's not the only version. But, but here's one author, uh, Karen Bradshaw, and this is what she says about her, uh, her understanding of rights of nature and property. So she says, um, expanding property rights to a previously excluded group does not change the existing framework of property. Existing land ownership, property boundaries, rights to exclude animals, and systems of recording property remain totally unchanged under my proposal. Rights expansion is not redistribution. No one takes the land or property away from current land owners. So in this sense, it's a very conservative proposal in this form, right? It doesn't change property relations. Um, and it doesn't, um, take, it doesn't redistribute anything. So the world stays like it is, with no changes in property, no redistribution, just a new right is recognized. One that's supposed to be strong enough to stop the interest of, of, of capital, or land capital, industrial capital. And I think this is problematic. So any kind of politics of nature that doesn't really challenge the property relations themselves um, is, is, I think, too weak uh, to fight against the, the interest that will destroy it. And I think also some of these uh, rights of nature theories, they have very shaky, they have very skeptical, uh, debatable uh, biological foundations. Right? So you need to, if, if you're going to have a rights of nature theory, it has to, I think, challenge properly and not be based on any biological foundations of the earth. Second, um, legalizing nature can also lead to creating new assets in, in, in natural capital, in ecosystems, in biodiversity banks, which is a, like a common strategy of, of green capital today sponsored by the EU, the IMF, or Bank, hundreds of NGOs. They want to, uh, they want, they want to, make, they want to use the ecological crisis to, to, to spur new growth strategies by, by, by turning biodiversity into a bank. Right? And many people have shown problems with this, like having a pistoner, like Jeremy Butler, that creating new assets usually, or almost always, leads to new forms of extraction, right? new forms of profit making, new forms of crisis, which reproduce the problem that they're trying to solve. Um, furthermore, you know, some of these strategies of legalizing nature presuppose a certain valuation of nature, right? um, valuing the good of a, of a forest in monetary terms. And I think this, is, you know, valuing nature is very complex, uh, very difficult um, to do. 
And and to do so in quantitative terms can really deny the plurality of non-economic values in every ecosystem, right? Which cannot always be commensurable. Right? It's hard to it's hard to value the the experience or the um, the the um, necessity of a river in, in, in monetary terms without understanding all the, the complex roles that that river has for people, for nature, for the biotech ecosystem. So so I think such valuations can, can do harm, and, and, if, and sometimes if they're realized, they can also be too weak. So I think legalizing nature in this sense I'm talking about um, is not the best strategy for promoting sustainability or protecting ecosystems or transforming our relationship with land. It would have to be something stronger. So now let me talk about a second strategy. The second one is called, I think, the moralization of nature. So if the legalization of nature is not adequate to the task of relating to nature in a way that can block the ongoing social and ecological catastrophe, then perhaps we need another strategy. The legalization of nature remains a mere formal strategy, right? Without a conscious, without a guiding vision of what should be done, without a moral center. So then what we need is not a legalization, but a moralization of nature. So what does it mean to moralize nature? So first, it can mean the attribution of moral value and worth to nature through a particular moral philosophy. But the question is always, how much value? And what kinds of value? Uh, is it exchange value? Is it moral value? Uh, you know, what kind of value shapes our, our, our what kind of value theory can, can we use to judge the appropriate uh, worth of nature? Um, so first, it can mean acting within a utilitarian moral vision. Right, this sounds counterintuitive, but there's many utilitarian uh, moral visions of nature. So relating to a particular natural environment or ecosystem with the idea of making the best use of it. Right? Not just for humans, but for all beings that suffer. Second, it can mean acting under, under a spiritual sense of value. Right? One that emphasizes aesthetic beauty, um, living nature, personal experience. Three, it can could entail a, a biocentric or ecocentric conception of value, one which focuses on the intrinsic value of living ecosystems itself and their interdependent flourishing. Well, here's like those are three uh, very quick sketches of different valuations or organizations of nature, and I take these uh, three examples from a study on um, on the biggest uh, single ecosystem in North America, in, in North America uh, which is the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem in Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Which is the, the near, it's a nearly intact ecosystem in the northern temperate zone of the Earth. And there's a study by Justin Sorrell who shows the different moral, moral frameworks for relating to the Yellowstone National Park over time, starting with utilitarian and um, um, spiritual and biocentric forms of understanding the value of this preserve. Now, these various organizations of nature they have they shape different practices, feelings, and beliefs. Um, in which our relations are invested with moral and spiritual meaning, which allows us to distinguish between right and wrong uses to the natural environment. Uh, there's also another way of moralizing nature, which does not just subject nature to one of our moral philosophies. In this sense, we can think of moralizing nature as creating new values for nature, such as the ones that you know, environmental philosophers like Dale Jameson say, you know, creating respect for nature or the autonomy of nature. Um, or biocentric egalitarianism, uh, talking about the health of the natural environment, um, even the concept of planetary boundaries, it's kind of a moral concept. Um, this could use ideas of care, concern, stewardship. You know, there are frames of degrowth, conviviality, or alternative epistemologies. There's, there's a wide variety of new moral um, worldviews that are being developed and thought about now um, that, that have different practices associated with them, like conservation, preservation, repair, Animal ethics, deep ecology, ecocentrism. These beliefs can entail, you know, saving resources, defending forests, protecting species, doing community defense, political advocacy, social protest, and more. <coughs> the purpose of moralizing nature is to develop, you know, strong guidelines that can orient our action towards threatened environmental conditions of existence for the sake of living things. So while nature today confronts modern subjects as disenchanted and empty, as resources for use, as sinks for dumping, the task would be to make nature moral again, right? To bring back the intrinsic value of nature with new duties towards respect, concern, and care. 
Now, there are a lot of attempts to do this in philosophy, in ethics, and in practice. Um, you know, whether like re rectifying kinds of epistemic injustice about those communities that already have knowledge of nature, recovering alternative epistemologies, um, embracing ecological ethics. All these are kind of different ways of moralizing nature, in my view. But moralizing nature is not just something we do for ourselves. I mean, we do to nature, it's also something we do to ourselves. We change our relation to nature is also changing our behavior towards each other through new forms of recognition, approval, and disapproval. So that's why moralizing the wilderness, for example, doesn't mean just like thinking about the wilderness as a moral subject. It's, it's more, it's closer to you know, moralizing like smoking, right, or trash. It's a way of relating to something um, that sanctions it being good or bad or you know, a certain kind of practice around it. It's, it's a social relation to nature, this moral, this moral trash. It's a way of incorporating moral standards in your practices that people previously thought were not normal. Now the strong argument for this is that you need a moral like a moralization in order to motivate individuals to act. Right? You need people to bind themselves to a larger goal or principle. So a, a, a politics of nature cannot then be purely formal, uh, objective, or abstract. It has to be kind of it has to come from within as well. Like it has to be a subjective maximum. Um, otherwise it will remain a dead now the problem with this uh, moralization is that the, the, the simple problem is that it cannot be required of anyone, right? It cannot be forced or imposed on anyone's moralization. It has to be freely chosen, or else it contradicts itself as a moral principle, freely and actively embraced by individuals themselves. So you know you have this moral theory, and then how do you want to distribute? How do you want to share it? How do you want people to take it upon themselves? Right? That says it remains. Um, it remains a wish. It remains a moral wish. Um, usually, moral visions are tied to particular communities as well. Um, and, and, and in that sense, you know, to, to embrace a particular moral vision would mean joining a certain community, or kind of abstractly taking on this wish for oneself. So, without being part of a community in which this moral view is present, it's hard to see it as anything else but another particular um, like world view, another thing to choose in the marketplace of morality. Now, can I come to my third approach? If the legalization of nature remains you know, merely formal and external, and if the moralization of nature remains merely subjective and internal, then we need another strategy that can combine both the formal and subjective, the external and the internal approaches to the natural world. If the legalization of nature cannot be easily internalized, and if the moralization of nature cannot be easily universalized, then we need another option that can both be internalized and universalized. So, is there a politics of nature that can do this? Um, my answer is yes. Um, I call this a socialization of nature. You know, referencing, referencing this old tradition, this old idea of socializing um, the means of production, right? socializing housing, socializing healthcare. So, what would it mean to socialize nature? Like we would socialize other uh, other goods. So this is a political strategy that would ground both the external and internal dimensions of transforming our relation to the natural world in a social process of democratizing our relation to the non-human nature, to challenge both the individualist and the communitarian logic by which nature is received as an object, as a value, as an input. So first of all, to socialize nature is to you know, reveal the always already sociality of nature, right? the, our, our social relations to nature. The fact that nature is already socially produced in a certain sense. But it's not just an epistemological project of understanding you know, the sociality of nature. It's also a practical project, right? Practical socialization of nature. Like there are calls for practical socialization of housing, healthcare, energy, or education. This means transforming our relationship to certain basic goods, right? So shifting the, the ability of access, ownership, and, and, and the very understanding of how, um, of how we incorporate the natural sphere into a, co a coherent um, form of life. So when it comes to housing, for instance, you know, there's calls for socializing real estate um, in Berlin. This means you know, uh, legally expropriating them through a democratic referendum, and then transferring ownership to a new body in which tenants and experts and um, you know, politicians, they come together and they protect this good from private and state interference you know, for those who use it. So this form of socialization is grounded in the um, German Grundgesetz, the basic law, which permits the socialization of land, means of production, and natural resources, 
the very idea of socializing natural resources is actually already in the German Constitution, right? In a sense, it just hasn't been taken, has been used. And the history of this idea of socialization really comes back, comes from the Weimar Constitution, and it comes from the German Revolution, and all the people that were discussing this concept, many of whom became um, members of the Institute for Social Research as well. So socializing energy companies today would mean you know, also perhaps expropriating them from private or state ownership, right? not nationalizing them, not just giving them over to the state, but creating a new body that can um, use them for a you know, different good. Reorienting them towards a kind of just decarbonization, dark decarbonization or planned decarbonization or other aims. So socialization in the way I mean it does not necessarily mean nationalization or collectivization of land. It means you know democratic planning of the economy, or whatever that is, democratic planning. Um, in the economy, this has to do with like horizontal and vertical coordination of firms, usually in looking at investment according to non-economic um, non values. So how do we invest in the future, but not according to profit, but according to the kind of goods we want? My simple plan is like, how do we think about nature also in this sphere? Right? Uh, it's not primarily about taking property into state ownership, or, or just protecting the commons, you know, although that can be part of it. It's like how do you integrate ecosystems into a plan for administering the provision of like human and non-human needs? So how do you take non-human needs into consideration um, when, when thinking about like, um, the use of the based economy? So there can be as many forms of socialization as there are kinds of goods to be socialized, right? Um, there can be full socialization, partial, active, passive, Gradual, um, immediate, there's all kinds of theories of what socialization means. I'm going to Let me just lay out, like, let me give one quote from a uh, 1920 text, you know, 100 years ago, by Otto Neurath, the, the famous analytic philosopher. Um, so he, he gave many lectures on socialization to the, to the workers in, in Bavaria and in Saxony. And this is what he says in 1920 Whoever is striving for the socialization of the economy thus has to ask, how will it alter the distribution of housing? food, clothing, education, and entertainment, work, illness, and hardship, i.e. the plasticity of the economy. How will, it, how will it influence the exploitation of all resources, economic efficiency? Will it still allow crises to occur and tolerate the waste of resources? I mean, already in 1920, talking about the waste of resources, caused by numerous retail outlets and useless variation? How will it change the control over economic life? which, by the way, is not just demanded for the sake of new distribution and use of resources by the people, but also in its own right. So already in 1920, he's thinking about, you know, how do you incorporate non-economic values, non-economic criteria to thinking about the economy, for instance, the way of resources. So although a few socialization laws of the past, like concerning coal, um, uh, the, this kind of plan and movement kind of fell silent. Two minutes, good, I think. Um, so the legacy of socialization was carried out in the Weimar Constitution, in the, the, in the German Constitution as well, also in, in conceptions of workers' rights, co-determination, um, and the socialist calculation debate. There are many kind of movements for socialization in the past 50 years, the rise and fall, um, in, in, in the steel industry, in the housing uh, market today. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking how we have an ecological perspective on this, on this movement of socialization. So what does this have to do with nature, right? Well, philosophers like John O'Neill and Thomas Ubel, they have very clearly shown how Otto Neurath's socialization plans are some of the first attempts at ecological economics. Right? This whole idea of ecological economics comes from here. Right? Speaking about speaking through a dynamic economy according to its physical components and constraints, and not just marginal utility costs. So Neurath was a non-market socialist. Right? He promoted a theory of um, in natura or in-kind calculation which uses non-monetary, non-quantitative measures for determining um, the distribution and allocation of resources, goods, and needs. So market economies use the price signal, right? We use prices to, to uh, reduce information so that we know the supply and demand of societies. And this is Hayek's big critique of none of that, right? You know, you cannot abolish money, you cannot abolish price, we need to get the information from society itself. I think, um, I think Hayek's Critique of Neurath is very strong and important, and we should kind of think through it more, understand, shouldn't just dismiss it. But I think our needs are much more heterogeneous than price signals can ever tell us. Right? 
Um, I don't think you can just monetize the value of the ecosystem. Or, or, or that even if we can, that we should. It's a certain, there's a certain monism there. So what would it mean to socialize not just housing, um, industry, healthcare, but you know, natural resources, like ecosystems or habitats? That's the question I'm thinking through. Like, can you socialize um, water? Oh, no, or socializing certain natural resources is clear, right? Um, like gas or um, certain minerals. It can mean taking possession of them away from private individuals and from state ownership, putting them in the hands of those who use them and need them to decide how to best manage them according to a kind of planned, ecological, and sustainable and social um, criteria. I would say for human and non-human um, users. So that's kind of simple. But the hard one is you know, ecosystems themselves, right? habitats, wildlife, not just minerals or resources. Can those be socialized? So if socialization is a process of democratization of the economy, then what would it mean to democratize you know, nature? Do we need, you know, like socialization, there's soldiers and workers' councils who decide on the use of, or, or who make plans for how to run their workplace. Do we need species councils, right? Ecosystem councils. Councils understand um, what an ecosystem needs with experts and users. I think it would be protecting and integrating various ecosystems into a form of life, to how we conceive of the needs and, and our own needs and needs of the planet. But I think first of all, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a provocation. It's a way of asking, allowing these questions of value to be asked in public, right, as a, as a public debate um, in the first place, so that we can use these incommensurable multiple criteria for human and non-human flourishing to think about our natural world. Okay. that nature's legal subjectivity can be cast in constitutional law. 
And second, the connection between nature's value creation and its rights. The culture of Pachamama is based on the notion of the fertility of the earth and thus of nature's value creation for the good life it won the year. Natural goods provide so called ecosystem services such as pollinating plants, filtering water, regulating erosion, stabilizing weather, forming humus, providing medical substances, energy sources, and building materials, etc. These ecosystem services are the basis for nature to deserve its own rights. And in my talk, I shall make an attempt to show that the rights of nature can also be justified in societies which are characterized, which are characterized by property laws. Property rights and rights of nature are no contradiction. On the contrary, rights of nature can be justified by referring to property rights. And next slide. Just one minute. Oh, it's a nice, nice picture. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, there are four steps. First, I will distinguish the rights of nature from anthropocentrism. The rights of nature go beyond the common sustainability theories of utilitarianism and environmental ethics which stand on the foundation of anthropocentrism. In anthropocentrism, ecological sustainability is justified by referring to the value nature has for human beings. Secondly, I will deal with ecocentrism. According to ecocentrism, nature is not really a value to humans, but has intrinsic value itself. The rights of nature, however, when viewed from a legal perspective, cannot be justified by any conception of that, neither by an instrumental value of nature for humans, nor by an intrinsic, intrinsic value inherent in nature. Thirdly, I will therefore develop an alternative conception of rights of nature that goes beyond ecocentrism. In this conception, rights of nature are derived from existing property laws. The rights of nature results from the rationality of law itself. In this respect, the rights of nature merely make explicit what is already recognized in existing law. Without any metaphysical or religious worldviews, the rights of nature can be justified by emerging from the rationality of existing property rights. So I come to anthropocentrism. Anthropocentrism is understood as the, fact as, sorry, as the fact of ascribing an instrumental value to nature. Here, nature does not possess a value itself. Rather, nature is worth protecting because it is valuable to humans. It is valuable in relation to certain interests of persons or institutions. In this respect, sustainability is not good in itself, but good for humans. Two varieties of anthropocentrism can be distinguished, the utilitarian theory of sustainability and environmental ethics. In the utilitarian theory of sustainability, nature is given an economic value. Sustainability here is of greatest benefit to all in economic terms. It is used for the privately organized market that provides wealth and improves well-being to as many people as possible. Nature is valuable because it serves as a resource for an economy that creates wealth. Natural resources are exploited as energy sources, food, building materials, so that as many people as possible can participate in an energy supply, basic security, transportation and housing infrastructures. If wealth is to be maintained or even improved for all, nature must therefore also be preserved. The benefit of sustainability then is the preservation of nature as a resource for an economy that creates wealth and improves well-being. From a utilitarian perspective, sustainability must be profitable for market actors. Its economic benefits work out as cost benefits. Cost benefits arise from sustainability when the consequences of, for example, global warming lead to economic costs that exceed the costs 
of sustainable climate policies. Cost benefits also arise when an ecological production conversion yields economic profits. Ecological sustainability requires economic profitability. Two measures promote such efficient sustainability, an incentive structure and market regulation. First, incentives must be created for market actors that lead to ecological sustainability in production, consumption and trade. Sustainability must be economically rewarding. It must allow costs to be reduced and profits to be increased. One example of this is emissions trading. Trading in emissions certificates is intended to create incentives to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Taxes on high emission production methods and supply chains, as well as tax finance subsidies, provide additional incentives for investment in emissions neutral production and technologies. Such an incentive structure requires the pricing of nature. Natural resources must have a price so that the costs of their consumption can be compared with those of their conservation. Second, the market must be effectively regulated by the legislature. One instrument for regulation is the environmental law. Legal regulation of the market must ensure that costs arising from production, consumption and trade induced environmental damage cannot be externalized by market experts. Such costs must be reflected in companies' accounting. The penalties for violating environmental laws must far outweigh potential profits in order by sustainability compliant economic activity to pay off. Through regulation, the state thus prevents profits from being privatized and costs from being socialized. Environmental da damage caused by private companies does not need to be remedied by public measures. The, utilitar the utilitarian concept of sustainability has two weaknesses. The first is that a sustainable economy is incompatible with growth, at least according to current knowledge. Proposals of green growth or the Green New Deal do not explain how a sustainable economy is possible without loss of wealth and well-being. Even in the near future, for example, there are no technologies in sight that will decouple economy from fossil or nuclear energy sources without making production and consumption more expensive. Instead of incentives for growth for all, Social and economic conditions should be created under which personal losses of wealth are fairly distributed so that they can be accepted by all by majorities. The second weakness arises from the contradiction that private property favors the destruction of nature and at the same time is presupposed by utilitarian sustainability. On the one hand, a strong protection of private property is the functional requirement of a privatized economy, which is supposed to provide wealth. On the other hand, private property rights are the incentive structure par excellence that drives climate warming, global pollution, resource depletion, and species extinction. In relation to private property rights, sustainability obligations are just soft claims. With strong private property, utilitarian sustainability presupposes the same functional requirement against which soft sustainability obligations cannot prevail. In this respect, it is doomed to ineffectiveness from the outset. Secondly, <coughs> anthropocentrism takes the shape of environmental ethics. Environmental ethics is based on the anthropocentric assumption that nature is worth protecting because humans need nature. As the basis of human existence, nature deserves protection. The special feature of environmental ethics is that it, that it justifies the protection of nature by moral claims, which humans owe to each other. 
In this respect, ecological obligations do not apply towards nature, but only towards human beings. Nor is there an intrinsic claim to the preservation of nature. Obligations of sustainability derive from moral claims, from moral claims, from claims, for example, of physical integrity, quality, and freedom. Nature deserves protection because these moral claims relating to natural goods are met by sustainability obligations. Different moral claims are violated by the pollution of air, water, and soil, by global warming and species extinction. In so far as they affect health, they violate a moral claim to bodily integrity. They also infringe the moral principle of equality. People have an equal right to acquire and exercise basic cap capabilities. Industrial and post-industrial societies with high standards of wealth, but also high levels of natural degradation, have so far enabled the members to exercise such capabilities better then it will be, be, will be possible for future generations when pollution, global warming, resource depletion and species extinction will have reached levels that strongly reduce wealth. Moral equality is thus violated by the agents of global warming, living at the expense of future generations who will have to live with the consequences. Finally, the principle of freedom is violated. Pollution, global warming, resource depletion, and species extinction will put pressure on future generations to adapt their lifestyles. This need to adapt reduces the possibility of determining one's own way of life. Migration, forced by global warming, consumption, constrained by pollution, and poverty and, poverty and deaths due to increased health risk and rising environmental costs reduce the scope of self-determination. Future generations will have less freedom than present ones. In this respect, the endangerment of the national basis of life also violates the principle of freedom. On the basis of moral claims, persons may be obliged to sustainability. If persons contribute to pollution, global warming, and extinction of species, they may be expected to, the, to refrain from endangering the natural basis of life. Such environmental obligations, however, have only little force against economic functional requirements such as growth, competition and extraction. Environmental ethics and economic requirements form different areas of validity, each of which follows its own logic and justifies itself on its own grounds. In this regard, the conflict between economic requirements and environmental ethics can no longer be resolved on a common basis of reasons. There is no common ground that could mediate between the two. But where normative conflicts can no longer be resolved by reasons, it will be decided by power. When the reasons without when the reasons withdraw from conflict resolution, resolution the resulting gap is filled by power. On the side of economic property rights, corporations can use their ownership power to exert pressure on legislators to dismantle, soften, or block environmental policies. Duties to future generations, for example, therefore regularly are undermined by the interests of economic proprietors. In anthropocentrism, sustainability lacks of binding force and effective power. This circumstance explains the harmlessness of environmental policies which often have to yield to the functional requirements of the economy. So next slide please, yes. and then come to ecocentrism. <coughs> ecocentrism assumes an inherent value of nature. Nature is not only of value to humans, but has a value itself. In contrast to anthropocentrism, the effectiveness of sustainability seems to increase when nature itself has a normative content and its value no longer depends on the demands, interests and needs of people. The assumption 
the nature has a value for people is really replaced by the idea, by the idea that nature itself has a value. In ecocentrism, the inherent value of nature is derived from particular attributes of nature. Nature deserves our rights because it possesses attributes such as fertility, integrity, or wholeness. Assumptions about the value rely on ontological assumptions about natural features. In this respect, ecocentrism invokes an ontology of value. According to this, Ontological assumptions about nature allow conclusions to be drawn about the value of nature. Value assumptions derive from the following ontological assumptions. Nature as a vulnerable and living entity, a wholeness or integrity of nature, a teleology of nature, or nature as a gift. However, values cannot be justified by ontological assumptions. Ecocentrism is based on a naturalistic fallacy. From a description of what is, no prescription of what ought to be results. The description of the fertility of nature does not include an explanation of the reason of why she has normative content. Even if her fertility could be described it would remain unclear why she deserves recognition. A normative reason for the rights of nature is needed, which, however, cannot be taken from one of, the, of its attributes, such as fertility. <coughs> Two variants of ecocentrism can be distinguished, a religious and a scientific ecocentrism. Religious ecocentrism is based on the idea of a sacrality of nature. Here, nature has a sacred status that gives nature an intrinsic protection and prohibits it from being instrumentalized for humans' interests. The sacred stands for the intrinsic value of nature and is supposed to protect it from depletion, exploitation, and destruction. In Ecuador, Bolivia, and Colombia, for example, the rights of nature are based on the sacred conception of nature as Pachamama who is revered as a life-giving deity. The Maori mythology of the sacred provides the basis for the intrinsic value of nature in New Zealand. Its principle of Vanuagatanga, which means kinship, linking all natural goods, and kaitia tikanda, responsibility towards all natural goods. In North America, animistic and pantheistic notions of a sacred nature are invoked to defend nature's intrinsic value. In Buddhism, the sacred status of nature is manifested through religious rituals of sacrifice. Sacrifice expresses a commitment to nature that derives from its intrinsic value. Moreover, a sacredness of all creatures, of all creatures are taught in Christian theology. Finally, in social and legal sciences, occasionally one finds the view of establishing the intrinsic value of nature with the help of a new mythology. Bruno Latour, for example, promotes it by seeking to revive the myth of Gaia, Mother Earth. And Christopher Stone, which was mentioned by uh, Jacob before, the author of Should Trees Have Standing, promoted a re-enchantment of law in his influential writings on environmental law. In each of these conceptions of nature, nature is recognized as having a sacredness because of one of its attributes, such as fertility, gives it intrinsic value. Scientific <coughs> ecocentrism, on the other hand, assumes that value ontology satisfies the standards of knowledge. For example, the assumption about a teleology of nature is attempted to be justified scientifically. It is assumed that its goals have normative content, that nature's goals are not bad, like perishing, but good, flourishing, and therefore deserves rights. It is presupposed that, existing, that existence is an intrinsic good and that being deserves priority over non-being. 
any notion of inherent, of inherent value in nature ultimately presupposes that existence is intrinsically valuable, meaningful, or desirable. Such statements about the meaning of existence, however, constitute a metaphysical axiom that cannot be proved. Occasionally, this insight breaks through in the acknowledgement that no proof can be made of the value of nature and thus of egocentrism. Religious egocentrism accepts this unjustifiability and draws the conclusion that the notion of nature's intrinsic value is ultimately based on religious beliefs. At first, it appears that as its failing to dispense with justification and instead to invoke religious beliefs. However, if we look at it more closely, this renunciation turns out to be its advantage in taking into account the unjustifiability of nature's inherent value. Theology and mythology acknowledge the unjustifiability without abandoning the notion of value of nature. However, because of its unjustifiability, the religious notion of the value of nature lacks a validity that is binding on all persons and institutions. And I come to the last part here uh, on sustainable property. One can only escape the dilemma between anthropocentrism and ecocentrism if one succeeds in justifying the rights of nature without referring to any inherent value of nature. The value of nature cannot be derived from its attributes. Nature deserves own rights without an inherent value. The key to justify the rights of nature lies in the property theoretical approach. The rights of nature can be conceptualized as nature's property rights in its resources. They take, in, they take the form of sustainable property rights. They emerge from the logic of existing property rights itself. If humans have property rights, then there is no reason to withhold them from nature. Nature, has, nature thus possesses property rights on one condition if humans have property rights. Existing property rights are a major cause of the global ecological crisis. They are the gateway to climate change, resource depletion, global pollution and species extinction. Up to now, property rights have entitled people to use and consume natural resources in the same way as other goods that they call their own. Property rights generally outweigh sustainability. This imbalance is the main reason for the harmlessness of all current efforts to protect the climate and the environment. Legal measures against ecological crisis are only promising if the protection of nature is put on an equal footing with property rights. Sustainability must have the same status as the fundamental right to property. The rights of nature must be on a pair with property rights. This idea only gets a special twist from the fact that property rights are not weakened or even abolished in order to increase sustainability. On the contrary, ecological sustainability is strengthened by expanding property rights and transferring them to nature. By extending property rights, nature is given a legal subjectivity that protects it intrinsically. In this respect, ownership of nature is put in check by transferring it to nature. Property is thus applied to nature precisely in order to save nature from it. At first glance, it may seem counterintuitive to save nature from ownership by transferring it to nature. However, ecological sustainability, and this is my proposal, derives from property rights itself. It is their own logic that they are constrained by obligations of sustainability. Property rights therefore do not weaken but strengthen ecological sustainability because sustainability is inscribed in property. 
property and sustainability are not opposites, but are brought together in the form of sustainable property. This view is based on two arguments. The first argument of nature's own rights derives from a value theory of property. According to this theory, the creation of value entitles a person to ownership of the values created. The rule applies to existing property rights, but also to nature's so-called ecosystem services. Natural goods provide ecosystem services, such as pollination of plants, filtering of water. In the property theoretical argument for the rights of nature, value theory is now applied to ecosystem services. If value creation entitles to ownership, and if ecosystem services contribute to value creation, then nature is entitled to ownership of its resources. According to the second argument, the obligations of ecological sustainability result from, a, from nature's property rights. Property, property protection is central for this. Property rights perform a protective function. They protect property from being used at will by others or from being destroyed, damaged or defaced. This protection of property also applies to the property rights of nature. Nature's property rights impose an obligation not to jeopardize the preservation of natural assets. Users are, positively speaking, obliged to sustainability. The use of natural resources always involves the use of property which belongs to nature. Due to the protection of property, users are therefore obliged to use natural assets in a sustainable manner. Because nature owns its goods, and its property, like any other property, deserves protection, humans are obliged to use nature in a sustainable manner. Therefore, property rights include sustainability obligations. Let's have a closer look at the first argument. One concern needs to be addressed. It is said that the creation of value entitles a person to ownership of the values created. This rule applies to labor. But why should it apply to ecosystem services? We will find an answer in three steps, and this takes only two minutes. Uh, first, the rule of value creation entitles to property applies to labor. Whenever humans contribute to value creation through labor, it follows that they have a right to ownership of the value produced. Thus, starting from labor, the rule of value creation entitles to property is established. Second, the rule is applied to natural resources by means of their processing. It is not a supposedly pure, untouched, wild, and original nature that is used, but resources that only become usable through their processing. Processing is a form of labor. Therefore, the rule developed from labor is applied to natural resources. If natural resources are processed, the rule is necessarily applied to nature. Thirdly, with this application of the rule to natural resources, the sphere of application of the rule is extended to nature. Nature falls within the scope of the rule only by virtue of its processing. If processing is a form of labor that entitles to ownership of its yields, and if natural resources are processed, then the sphere of application of the rule is, is extended to natural resources. The rule, the rule value creation entitles to property also <coughs> applies to nature because it is a case of value creation that falls under the rule. To put it negatively, without the processing of natural resources, the rule would not apply in relation to nature. If nature could be used in its supposed purity wildness and originality and did not have to be processed first, the rule value creation and titles to property should not be extended to nature and the rule would thus not apply to ecosystem services. However, as soon as natural resources are processed, the sphere of application of the rule also extends to nature and the rule applies to ecosystem services. Thus, 
if in the case of natural resources the rule value creation and prior to property applies to labor, then it must also be applied to ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are therefore accompanied by a right to ownership of the value, and I come to the conclusion, which was only three sentences. Um, <laughs> Climate policy has so far failed because it cannot be enforced against property rights. Neither anthropocentrism nor ecocentrism take this conflict of property into account. But instead of banning property rights, the inherent, inherent logic should be used to promote ecological sustainability. Property rights in natural sources is limited by ecological, so, ecological obligations inherent in the very idea of property. Sustainability is not something external to property, but arises from the logic of property itself. Property then is an argument not against, but for sustainability. Thank you for your attention. We are going to move now to the last presentation. The next presenter is Joaquin Donabuel Martin. He is researcher at CONICET and he's a lecturer at the University of Buenos Aires. And the title of his presentation is Modernity and the Universal IU. I don't know if I pronounced it right. Yeah. Okay. So the floor is yours. And Thanks a lot. Just a second, I will get the presentation going. Okay. All right. Well, uh, so maybe a couple disclaimers at the beginning. Modernity at the universal. Ayu, Ayu means commune. In Quechua, is a very important word in the history of Latin American Marxism since Maria Tee. So just to clarify. Uh, originally, I was going to try to stage a philosophical conversation between Moshe Boston, Martin Hagen, and Bolivar Echeverria. I will address him at last. But then I decided uh, that due to time constraints, I will skip the, the Martin Hagen part. I think he brings something very interesting for clarifying what Boston said, but it will be too long if I go in that way. And third, uh, uh, when I say immanent critique of capital, I'm, I'm saying immanent critique of capital as it is developed in the thought of Boston. In particular, not, child, not in many critics, which may be a broader concept in critical theory. And what we bring these uh, uh, issues uh, to the table about ecological politics? Well, because every time we are talking about the energy, energy transition or, or, or um, uh, prospects for a sustainable economy, there is um, an underlying philosophical debate about modernity and what should be modernity model technology and modernization processes um, and maybe it's broader. So in the global north we have this debate between the eco-modernists and the degrowthists maybe uh, and the eco-modernists uh, think that we are going to overcome the problems raised by modern society with another round of modernization by uh, developing green technologies or, or, or um, uh, sustainable energy sources and so on, and maybe the degrowthists are more distrustful of modernity and have more of a romantic uh, flavor that's not pejorative, analytically speaking, uh, romantic. And in Latin America as well, we have this uh, ongoing debate between the neo-developmentalists, who are usually uh, related to popular governments or pin type governments that seek these uh, processes of, of peripheral modernization, and the other extractivists who usually uh, um, claim that uh, uh, we need to, to stop uh, participating in, in the world market as Latin America has traditionally done, as an exporter of, of basic goods, and embrace uh, indigenous ideas of when we beer and the like. So there is this under, underlying debate, as I'm saying, about modernity, and so I will um, pick the discussion from there, and hopefully it will become clear uh, that it's relevant for ecological politics. So, my three thinkers, of what I will be uh, only talking about Boston and Echeverria, I believe are more dialectical in a way, and they are not like um, um, just um, caught in this unilateral uh, polarity between the modernizers and the romantics, but they try to develop in the spirit of critical theory what we would call a dialectics of modernity. 
And this means that uh, modernity for them is something that is neither profound nor simply unilaterally reject. Uh, but uh, you need to proceed by a immanent critique. And this means that capitalist society has created some emancipatory potentials, some emancipatory possibilities, which nevertheless it cannot actualize. And this means paying attention to contradiction, potentiality, and ambiguity, and regarding modern society as ambiguous inherently, as a combination of, 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 of things we like and things we do not like. Uh, and this in particular, um, in the case of Boston, means regarding capitalist technology as both oppressive and enabling. So it, it embodies forms of domination, uh, but it could uh, bring about emancipation. But I will also claim, and this in particular in Poston, that the strictly immanent critic of capital has problems or fails to accommodate the political possibilities of communal forms. Communal forms that come from the pre-capitalist past, but that are very important, very pervasive in the popular politics of, of the continent of Latin America, and I believe uh, possess uh, potentials for the future, ecological potential, potentials, for instance. So I will try to develop what I would call a supplementary dig, uh, um, drawing on Bolivar Echeverria and maybe a broader Latin American tradition. And this broader critique, I believe, uh, supplementary critique, I'm sorry, um, will enable us to, to address the embodied and embedded, but open to political contestation, metabolic dimension of social life, this dimension of stop Excel, uh, which is uh, now very much being discussed in Marxist scholarship. So, immanence. Uh, that's the first part of the presentation. Uh, addresses Poston. Um, Poston uh, claims in time, labor, and social domination that capitalism creates emancipatory possibilities. It cannot yet actualize. So he's uh, looking at this blockage of underlying potentials for for um, the construction of a more just um, uh, and free society. He starts uh, thinking of capitalism as a form of social mediation. Uh, as a, way in which or under which the social nexus or the social form is constituted. And he says that capitalism is uh, characterized by abstract, impersonal, and quasi-objective forms of social domination. This is historically specific. Pre-capitalist societies don't have this impersonal, abstract domination grounded on the value form or, or, or labor. Mm. Capitalist uh, form of social uh, mediation is compatible with the abstract economic freedom of commodity owners. Uh, it involves the dissolution of what Boston calls over social relations, that is, uh, the kind of relations that are not, um, so to speak, hidden beneath the veil of commodity fetishism. He says that pre capitalist society in general are constituted through over social relations, which means sometimes direct uh, relationship of uh, dependence or domination, think about uh, uh, feudal bonds. Uh, in capitalism, these uh, sort of over social relations tend to receive, and then we got this abstract social mediation, um, which involves ambiguous pro progress, because we get personal freedom out of that dissolution of the traditional social form, but at the same time involves a new form of, of social domination, which is uh, based on capital as subject, on this self-moving, self-positing, self-mediating category of capital. Capital is value that creates value and that sequesters the dynamic of society in an alienated fashion, ultimately. So it's a reformulation of the critique of alienation we have to stone. And what I, I find very interesting about his work, among other things, is his attention to material forms of production. According to Poston, technology is not neutral. That means that there is no one single linear uh, form of development of, uh, of technology. Uh, technology is not just based on the um, uh, accumulative uh, increase of the instrumental power of human beings, but on, on the contrary, the, the uh, technical forms of a society tend to be adequate to the social relations. So there is uh, this co-constitutive co relationship between technology and social relations. Uh, and industrial protection, as it has been developed in actual existing modernity or capitalist modernity, is adequate to capital as uh, the automatic subject, the alienated subject of modern society. And this means that material production is subsumed under this logic of capital. And therefore, that um, the systems of machinery, the, the industrial infrastructure of, of our society, materially embodies the logic of capital. So it's not neutral. 
this, does it mean that then we need to go and look at the destroying machines? No, that's not what Tom uh, brings to the table. We need not conceive uh, technical systems as close or incapable of, of transformation, but proceed by anyone in critique, as in society overall. And this means, once again, paying attention to contradiction, ambiguity, and potentiality, as it's uh, um, embodied in industrial forms of production. And this means that a material production, which is constituted as a mode of existence of capital, it's adequate to its logic, but it also contains emancipatory potentials capable of transcending capital. So, oh, there is a human sense. So, I quote Poisson. Marx uh, saw the negation of the structural core of capitalism as allowing uh, for the appropriation by, by people of the powers and the knowledge that had been historically constituted in an alienated form. He's following the Grand Prix uh, here, in particular, the fragment of the machines, very, very discussed lately. Mm. So, uh, what uh, Poston is thinking as an um, overall direction for, for social emancipation is the transformative appropriation by people of uh, inherited capitalist technology, um, which is not neutral, as I was saying, but can be uh, reappropriated and re-engineered, re -engineered, I'm sorry, uh, for, for bringing about a post-capitalist socialist or having society and that a uh, post-capitalist society will be partly based on the labor saving technology which is developed under capitalism. His uh, way of developing this is complex, uh, related to this idea of uh, dialectic of transformation and restitution of the labor hour, but ultimately Poston is aiming at the idea that under capitalist society um, uh, there is this um, structural pressure to introduce labor saving technologies which make an economy based on the expenditure of human labor obsolete, uh, ultimately. So there is, on the long run, a contradiction between wealth and value. I'm trying not to go very deep into the description of what Poston said, so I can move on to the discussion, but here's a core idea, I think. He claims that uh, Marxist analysis carries the notion of the overcoming of capitalism that does not imply and critically affirming industrial production as the condition of human progress, nor romantically rejecting technological progress per se. So he's trying to evoke both uh, romantic melancholia and ideological techno-utopianism, and think um, uh, under this idea of the, the unity of the critique of social relations and the critique of technology, that, that both must be carried together, and in both cases it's not a unilateral crit critique, it's a, it's a minimal critique that looks at um, underlying potentials or block potentials. So, modern technologies uh, embody the logic of capital, but um, possess this uh, uh, non-developed potentiality for emancipation. I will skip the Hegel part, as I say, I, I think this work clarifies a number of points, it's very good, but for the sake of time, this is uh, the conclusion of the first part my presentation, and it's that capitalist modernity is, um, can be subject to an human critique because it fails by its own standards. It's not so much for Poston and Hegel um, an incomplete modernity, but a distorted modernity because it values time, labor, and technology in ways that are fundamentally wrong. I mean, I would say this very quickly, I think Hegel um, very clearly shows that uh, the Marxian theory of value is a critical theory of the way we value time in, in capitalist society. Okay, that is a, he's saying this whole way of organizing our economy is distorted. But at the same time, um, capitalism posits or uh, puts in place the resources for both technical and normative for its own critique. So you can proceed imminently, and ultimately this means that actually existing modernity, and that is capitalist modernity, creates uh, the potentials for its own self-transformation. So you can work, like I'm saying, from within. And now I'm moving on to the Latin American tradition and see what kind of dialogue can we produce uh, with all the things I just said. Um, so I will raise uh, first a, a, an issue with this whole idea, which I largely endorse, of course. Uh, and so this section is called Commune. Uh, and the question that opens the section is, what do we do uh, what do we make of the rights of the past before the present and, and the future? What do we make of the romantic moment, which I believe must always be present in the, in the, crit in the, in the critique of modernity? You cannot do without it. Um, uh, and this means also 
Can we not recover some conditions of past societies for a future-oriented project that challenges social domination? And in particular, um, what do you make of communal forms of organization that pervade popular politics <coughs> on the continent, in Latin America? Must communal forms undergo capitalist modernization before becoming able to appropriate the emancipatory potentials of modernity? Communal forms are not exactly um, real socially uh, in terms of an abstract formal social nexus or social abstract social mediation like the one capital and value bring about. So, if you uh, live in a community or an indigenous uh, person or, or a peasant, uh, um, uh, yeah, and we grab the immanent critic of capital as developed by, by Postone. Uh, we need to say no. You cannot participate from modernity. You need to undergo this very painful, very violent, usually historically, process of dispossession, dissolution, proletarianization of the commune, and then subsumption of material production under this logic of capital. Or, in other words, this, this uh, would mean that Marxian critique would only be pertinent under abstract forms of social mediation as developed under capitalism. And there, this could be an underlying waiting room of history uh, uh, problems in Postone, or maybe, uh, even though he was by no means a historicist Marxist, he was not a, like a, following this idea of uh, linear development. But ultimately, I think there's a problem with this uh, a strictly immanent critique of capital. Or maybe there's some problem there with what Amy Allen called progress as fact. And going back to the Grundrisse very briefly, um, uh, I think it's interesting not to look just at uh, the fragment of the machines, but also a very, very famous fragment uh, in the Grundrisse manuscripts, which is the fragment about uh, those uh, forms of production that precede capitalism. Uh, one of the first uh, very, very clear fragments by Marx in his in, in old age, he, he developed this a lot more, and it's um, the attention that Marx uh, paid to peasant and communal forms. Uh, uh, and he was interested uh, about these communal forms because, in a way, he, he thought they provided some hints about what a post capitalist society would be. So, Marx also embraced this romantic moment. This has been lately emphasized by Saito in particular. So I put Marx on once, in, in the forms that precede capitalist society, the worker uh, relates to the objective conditions of his labor as to his property. This is the natural unity of labor with its uh, material presuppositions. So here Marx is kind of saying that the construction of communism would perhaps be the recovery on the basis of uh, certain historical and technical results of capital of the old communal unity between labor and its natural conditions. So, when, when trying to think communism here, Marx is looking at the past in order to, to move towards the future. It's a clear case of what Michel Leoui calls uh, revolutionary romanticism, uh, taking a detour through the past in order to think for the future. And this would mean something like recontextualizing capitalist technologies under a regime of production for use values and not abstract values. This might have a relationship with what Jacob was saying, uh, following Noyat. And here I quote Saito, uh, Marx recognized uh, that the uh, uh, particularities of pre-capitalist metabolism like, between humans and nature might be the source of vitality of certain rural uh, communities. So I just made uh, like two arguments um, um, uh, showing that Boston's uh, critique is limited. I don't think it's wrong, it's just limited. Um, one is uh, uh, that there could be an underlying waiting room of history trap there. So if you live under communal forms, you, you don't seem to be suitable uh, for Boston's critical theory. And the second argument I'm making is that, to some extent, communism would be the return to the community uh, under modern forms. Um, and how I move to, to what I would call a Latin American tradition uh, that I believe starts with Maria Tegui and uh, is still developing now. Uh, uh, I believe Bolivar Echeverria is the most interesting, or at least the one I like the most of the philosophers or, or thinkers of that tradition. And in this tradition, you can think um, the possibility of a post capitalist social form as the result of uh, a dialectic of the old and the new. Um, 
which at the same time um, uh, wishes to be modern and embrace a form of modernity, and at the same time um, uh, tries to do justice to this romantic moment I'm talking about. I'm quoting Alvaro Garcia Nera, very well known book here in Latin America, Forma Valor and Forma Comunidad. I took my, the title of my presentation from here. He says that the post capitalist form is a new identity and a new social national space based on the best of what was previously and what exists, that which exists. So uh, the ancestrality of this value as a direct component of the social form of the product of labor is linked to the new, new, newness of the universal character of use value, which gives a synthesis that surpasses everything that exists. The social universal community, or what we have to denominate the universalized IU, or the universalized commune. And this uh, universalized commune um, would come uh, out from this um, uh, uh, complex and um, um, uh, maybe whirlwind uh, te temporalities um, uh, which uh, bring forth this dialectic of the old and the new. And like I'm saying, I, I think there is something like a tradition here, I think in this, uh, under this dialectic of the old and the new, from Jose Carlos Mariate, uh, like I said earlier, to Martin Arboleda, for instance, he works in Chile, young scholar, very interesting. Um, uh, he says in Planet Remind, really nice book, it's in English. Uh, local communities encounters with uh, technological infrastructures of extraction, he's studying uh, the geographies of extraction of copper in northern Chile, are laying the foundations for the novel framework of generalized interdependence prefigured by notions of Cheque modernity or universal AI. I can explain later if you want what Cheque modernity means. And then, um, the closing part of my presentation, I move to Echeverria. <coughs> Um, just to introduce him, because he was also not that born in Argentina. <coughs> well, Oliver Echeverria was born in Ecuador in 1941. He moved to West Berlin in 61, and he lived there for like seven years. He studied at the Freie Universität. Uh, he didn't finish his dissertation, and uh, in 68, he went back, uh, came back to Latin America and went to Mexico and uh, uh, stayed there until the end of his life in 2010. Um, so he's a very uh, German-influenced uh, Latin American theorist. He translated Bata Benjamin in, in, into Spanish, um, very influenced uh, by the Franco school, largely influenced. And um, very much like Poisson and Hedrut, he claims that capitalist modernity is dual and contradictory. Um, at the same time, it awakens the technical and social potentials uh, for freedom and under what he calls a materially pacified existence. So, uh, for him, uh, modernity means uh, the possibility of uh, um, a more reconciled relation with nature, and that means, uh, uh, to begin with, not having to struggle for subsistence permanently, and he values positively that feature of modernity. And at the same time, uh, uh, he sees modernity as an aim in freedom. He says it opens the symbolic dimension of social life. Modernity is the experience of um, changing our identities and, and submitting them, submitting them to, to self-critique and self-transformation. But at the same time, he says that under this uh, capitalist form, which is covered by capital as subject, we don't really get uh, um, um, to enjoy these uh, potentials of modernity, they remain locked, pretty much like in Poston. So I quote him, at once fascinating and unbearable, the irreconcilable contradiction between the meaning of the concrete process of work or enjoyment, a social natural rule on the one hand, and the meaning of the abstract process of valorization, accumulation on the other. But he's talking about modernity, and here it's a bit more clear, perhaps, the ambivalence of capitalist modernity stems from the following. Paradoxically, the most radical attempt recorded in history to internalize the foundation of modernity, the conquest of abundance, undertaken by Western European civilization, could only be carried out through an organization of economic life that starts from the negation of that foundation. What Jerry is trying to, to convey in his Kinsethesis, uh, sorry, Modernidad y Capitalismo, that's the, the title of uh, that text, of the thesis on modernity and capitalism, is that 
this um, process of um, uh, overcoming material scarcity and conquering freedom remains, he says, sequestered in this uh, form of um, organization of material life uh, under which the production of his value, the production for the satisfaction of social needs, what he calls, following Marx, the natural form of production, has uh, become subsumed under uh, the production of abstract value, or, or, or if you will, we do not produce for satisfying social needs, but for uh, 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 increasing profits or, or, or development, developing um, uh, the, the economy of the enterprise. Um, and uh, what he's trying to, to, to bring to the table is that when you look at communal forms that precede capitalism, um, they do not produce uh, for um, this um, reified or alienated movement of self-valorizing value, they do not produce for capital or profits, but they produce uh, directly uh, use values in most cases. Uh, there can be markets in, in pre-capitalist society, but there's no uh, um, uh, dominating capitalist logic. Um, and he believes that uh, this um, block nature of capitalist modernity could be overcome by learning from the communal forms. Because in this communal forms, when you produce directly for use value, the labor process, the process of production, is not subsumed and under an alienated dynamic. Uh, and therefore, uh, you can just address the natural form of production directly. And just to clarify, the natural form of production does not involve substantive goals per se. It, it's open and politically contestable um, because uh, we humans have to decide how are we going to organize our natural form of production. This would be a point of coincidence with what Hegel calls spiritual freedom. So we are embodied biological beings uh, that need to sustain our own lives, but how are we going to sustain our lives? That's an open question. We need to figure that out on our own. And there is this spiritual dimension of our material existence or of the way we exist in nature, which means a form of practical self-relation that cannot be determined just causally. So I go just to clarify this. This is from another book, which is called Valor de Uso Utopia. He devoted a great deal of work to use to Echeverria, and he says, the social natural form uh, itself um, uh, is the process of, uh, um, I'm sorry, the social natural form of the process of social reproduction is constituted as a rather conflict that brings with it the transnaturalization of animal life. The concrete embodiment of this conflict is itself of necessity multiple. The social natural form thus implies a founding part of the subject with it himself. It's, what he's trying to convey here is that there is no um, blueprints uh, about how to carry the natural form of production uh, uh, through. Uh, it must be decided socially. But when you produce for value, you cannot decide that socially. So he says the political dimension of the natural form of production is sequestered. It's like a co opted <coughs> or subsumed under capital. And with this, I close. Um, trying to bring Boston and Echeverria under a conversation. I believe uh, enables us to, to, to envision the critique of capitalist modernity um, uh, under a dual ground. So, on the one hand, you have uh, to address what I would call the unaccomplished promises of capitalism, fundamentally two, I think, material abundance and actual freedom. And this means uh, 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 I conducted an imminent critique of capitalist technology and of the, cap of the capitalist, capitalist value for. But then, at the same time, uh, there is another grounding. Um, and this refers to what capital subsumed, dispossessed, and damaged communal forms that produce directly for use value, and that are often ecologically more sustainable than capitalist society. And this means uh, bringing back to the center of politics the issue of how are we going to conduct our social natural metabolism, and embracing what we could call a politics of the natural form of production. And uh, uh, I think that uh, the, probably the imminent critique of, of, of modern society uh, needs to, to consider this, this double grounding uh, simultaneously. And that means working both with what Stone and Hegel bring to the table 
and with uh, what the Chevrilla brings to the table. And this could lead, I think, to uh, an interesting conversation about uh, the critical fact. That's all. Thank you. Some time for questions, like uh, actually 15 minutes more, which is kind of good. I think you have to go, right? Two minutes. Two minutes. So let's say if someone has a question for Jacob, uh, if I, I can comment on that. Oh, yes. I don't know. I mean, I, I think the papers are very interesting, and I think all of our papers have like very strong proposals and also weaknesses. So I think the weakness of my paper is that it's um, kind of utopian. Should I say it was unrealized, hard to understand it? Probably. Who knows paper? There's a, there's a certain romanticism that I've noticed in yours. Which is always to me a question of scale. How do you scale up these, these projects? And with Tilo's, I mean, I think, I think there are, yeah, how strong is, is your proposal, right? Because I think there are rights and nature proposals that are very limited and, and constrained. So how radical would you put it on? And I think all these, so these are the questions that I think about when I, when I see your papers, right? How do we actually think of these strategies um, um, confronting the real world today? That's all So I don't know if you want to answer this one or... Well, yes, uh, I think um, one should distinguish between goals and um, the means to accomplish the goal. And the proposal of uh, sustainable, sustainable property rights and the rights of nature is not a goal. Uh, it, is, it is the means to, to, to strive for a goal for example, socialization. And what I found very interesting in your talk is you you were criticizing the legal approach, but when you when it comes to socialization, you were refer, referring to law, Article 15 of the Constitution. And the question is how how can we prevent such law like Article 15 of the Constitution? That's the question of the means, uh, uh, not the question of the law. I would say I would like to, to, to bring about a, a, a romantic moment and not a full-fledged romanticism, like um, uh, thinking about um, uh, what is idea of the, the dialect of the other day. I'm trying to, to overcome the blunt opposition between the modernizers and the romantics and think something else that's this critical modernity. Uh, Bolivar Cheveria was very much modern. He, he was claiming that uh, this post capitalist society would be uh, an alternative modernity. But usually, when we say alternative modernity, people think about geographically localized modernity. Like you have an Argentinian modernity, an Indian modernity, and that's all right. He also developed that idea with the, his concept of the Baroque, which is the form of modernity in Latin America. But uh, he, was, he had this much stronger concept of alter alternative modernity, which amounts to the idea of socialism or. or, or Post capitalism, if you, if you want to keep it more open, um, which could um, truly actualize what actually system modernity promises but cannot uh, deliver. And that this would be um, a democratic self determination also at the level of material production, is coming that way. I don't know if I answered that. So, thank you. He has to go. I have a question about oh, uh, uh, no, I, I, I can hear it if you want. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I have a question for all three of you. Really, but, I mean, I, I start with, with yours. I mean, one thing that, that strikes me about the third, I mean, about your proposal, yes. is not only that I, I would doubt that it's so token, because you mentioned like you already, always already, the social nature, nature of nature and so on. And I think you should spell this out a bit more mm -hmm. and make it kind of sensitive. But the question that arises with respect to Tito's critiques, uh, I mean, how does socialization of nature prevent us from the instrumental use? Yeah. That, I, was, I mean, still is something that maybe it's within this idea of the sociality of nature, but maybe not. We should at least. Um, okay. 
since we don't have much time, I will collect the questions. Okay. Regina, also, yeah, I think, yeah. That, that uh, fits nicely um, uh, to what Rano was uh, said, I have, um, for uh, Falcundo, I have, uh, you, you said that the communal forums also uh, undergo the capitalist modernization. I mean, this is a bit of the Rano's said. And you mentioned that yourself, that they are, they are part of it. And the way they, um, they reform themselves uh, under, um, in a way that they are not alienating uh, what's being produced, uh, that they are um, uh, allow equality and so on and so forth. So everything what you um, described um, is within the capitalist uh, modernity. They are part of it also in so far as they are based on a certain idea of self-reflection and um, and the uh, idea of um, uh, reasonableness and so on. So that's all in it. And, and you are completely aware of it. That's what I thought. I mean, that's why I uh, proposed that there are kinds of learning processes who came up with uh, certain ideas who are, which are in the Marxist tradition. Um, but that, that they are um, have something like technical progress in it at the same time. That's what you were describing about this postponed and um, um But so what? Um, I have, do you, first of all, you may have an example, um, and the second thing is, what does it then mean? Um, uh, with regard to uh, also those neoliberal ideas that you adapt first and you then produce something and you uh, do something like Famarto. So in a way you are uh, presenting yourself as a commune, uh, as a new way of life, uh, but that in itself then easily becomes a way of being part of those economization. Uh, so the commune itself is a kind of commodity that within the situation in which we are uh, is under the pressure to commodify itself. It's, it's not without market in a way, right? So uh, the, the question leads to that, so are you thinking about market, are you thinking about competition between the producing communities that are in a closed system. So these are more those practical um, uh, questions. And maybe one could also say, um, ask Tilo, and so we have time to discuss it. So, but, uh, but what is the, uh, also this idea uh, of um, Facundo about the, um, the in how far uh, is the idea of the right of nature realizable within capitalist society? So, and I know you're doing with the commodity and you're using it yourself um, in a way to show what is the added value and, and so on. But at the same time, um, it is still within uh, capitalist production and also the rights do not uh, allow completely that nature is protected. Of course it should be used, what's being protected at the same time. And so this, um, there's no food protection, and it should not be. But what about then the, the recovery, the compensation, and so on. So maybe you can we talk about it, but maybe it would be also to explain it here again, what it then means for um, under capitalism, the, the, nature, um, the law of nature and the rights of nature under capitalism. Thank you. So who wants to start? Which are okay. Okay. So, great question. Thanks a lot. Uh, um, so as for the 
I can bring together a couple of ideas because you both uh, mentioned that this idea that communal forms are, are not untouched, are not pristine or pure, and, and that's exactly why I like Echeverria, and I think it's a little different from some um, more hostile towards modernity, uh, the colonials, uh, for, like in your, it's always emphasizing the idea of the colonial movement, and this, uh, I believe, um, leads to a problem, which is that what the subaltern, so to speak, does politics, the subaltern does modern politics, uh, claims rights, um, uh, interpolates the state, um, demands democratic self-determination, uh, and um, I think what's interesting uh, um, about Chevalier precisely is that he's thinking that um, uh, this uh, dimension of production for use value, of, of, of um, production for the uh, uh, meeting of material needs uh, that um, appears in the commune can be an ideal for the future, can be an ideal for a, a, a post capitalist society. And that means that modern society, as constituted under the aegis of capital, can learn something from the communal past. But that means at the same time that communal forms can appropriate the results of, of modernity. And this was already what Mariategui was thinking in the 1920s, when he was looking at the, at the Inca Ayu, the, the, the Inca communes in the Andes, and he said, well, there are elements of practical socialism there, that like already embodied a, a, a socialist form. But at the same time, he had a struggle with the um, more nativist, uh, indigenous uh, thinkers who were already in Peru at the time, and he said, yeah, but it's not like I want to preserve the commune from modernity. Quite the contrary, I'm interested in, uh, in, in, in thinking how the commune can appropriate those results of modernity, and that, that's why I'm not discussing the whole Bostonian human critique. I would like to think that maybe there is a second order dialectics. <laughs> so to speak, you had the strictly human and the dynamic of capital, which creates these potentialities, these possibilities, which are great in terms, in particular, of uh, labor saving technologies and material abundance, but also the, the personal freedom we, we enjoy under modernity. Um, but then at the same time, we are coming uh, to the realization that at least the social framework under which we have had this relaxed material abundance and this personal freedom uh, is probably not sustainable. It also brings about domination. There is a freedom critique uh, we could uh, do to, to um, the capitalist form. And that means that um, um, it's not just that uh, capitalism came out of um, a, a, a progressive process that uh, is uh, blocked or limited, but also that we forgot something when capitalism uh, 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 subsumed the uh, globe. And that is um, that there are certain. We forgot that there is a political dimension about how are we going to conduct our material body life, our metabolism. Uh, and and so maybe this uh, dialectic of the old and the new is a little bit abstract. So it doesn't mean we need to preserve the community. It means that it can be more um, as they are. Uh, this has also um, in the famous uh, uh, draft that Marx wrote in Pérez Azulich, uh, famous, when he was going this way, uh, thinking about the Russian commune, saying, well, yeah, it can be the, the, the seed, the, the, the ground, social ground for, for socialism, because capitalism is already developed in the rest of the world, and the commune can appropriate the results of that uh, development and bring uh, something interesting that, that, that comes from the past. And this idea of alternative modernity, that's why it's not about insisting that modernity is domination. Quite the contrary, it means that um, it could be emancipatory and it could do justice to the romantic moment. Uh, um, and maybe the project of modernity and the project of romanticism uh, need to be like actualized together. Or at least that's what I would like to go to. As for examples, <laughs> but that's more complicated because the actual historical process is quite the contrary one. It's the dispossession of communal forms and as extractivism grows in, in the region, it gets worse. Uh, like nowadays, we got a uh, uh, lithium extraction in the north, and it's very important because we're going to need lithium for batteries and we're going to need lithium for uh, a more sustainable energetic ma matrix. But at the same time, and, uh, it's being uh, extracted under this very rapacious uh, uh, logic of, of, of uh, uh, extraction of profit. 
and it's um, um, attacking the communities that live in the Andes. Uh, it brings also ecological problems because it takes a lot of water in a desertified region. Uh, and uh, this means that sadly the historical trend does not go in, in, in the, into the direction of, of communal forms appropriating the potentials of modernity, but rather towards increased dispossession. Um, so, um, but I think that would uh, uh, bring about some more hopeful, let's, let's, let's hope, um, uh, form of politics is thinking, well, what if those local communities could appropriate those modern technologies and, and develop, it, uh, develop them themselves? And I think that would be the, the Maria Tevian answer, the, the answer that inherits from Maria de or for Machiavelli. Um, and just one last point about the market. And this dialectic of the old and I tend to think, is going to happen. Whether uh, it happens under a more socializing or more democratic form, or under the neoliberal form. Uh, uh, and um, communal forms that are um, the subaltern forms of life can be sold as commodities. Yes, and, and, and this means that um, capitalism is very flexible um, and can appropriate many forms of, of, of subjective experience and culture. Um, and perhaps uh, uh, what, what, what I'm, I'm bringing about with this idea of the universal value is um, what could be, but maybe not so much what's happening, which is more the commodification and dispossession of common form. Uh, that answers a little bit uh, to, to both of us. Yes, sure. Wouldn't this just mean to give up the idea of necessary states? So, you have learning processes everywhere and you can and they are defined. And they go both ways. They go both ways, but it's so but the, then you would just have to that every 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 existing society has to go through a certain and this is what Mark summed me about in the last speech later. So we say yeah, multi-geniality, which is now mm -hmm. Kevin Anderson, a million top number of classic scholars. Uh, and, yeah. yeah that's the idea. Okay. Since we are running out of time, just a quick uh, answer uh, to uh, your first question. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the concept of rights I'm using is an Hegelian uh, approach. And uh, I understand rights uh, as um, a normative things which are justified uh, by their normative validity. And um, this might be a um, um, distance between us. Um, I think the the um, the rights in, in the rights in, in Hegel philosophy of rights they are not justified on moral grounds neither they are justified on social social ethical grounds <coughs> but they are they're justified by a certain logic of validity unknown physics science etc. Uh, and in exactly the same sense, uh, I use uh, the term rights, uh, which is obviously not the same as uh, in law. This, and its claims uh, um, have that uh, government should imply certain laws, uh, but they are not a positive law itself. And your uh, second question on self ownership, you know, what I really regret is that I use the term self ownership in my book here because it's so misleading. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I'm, uh, I started the book with the uh, term um, um, the, the river owns itself, and this is very misleading because if you own, if nature owns its resources, it is not a uh, uh, concept of self-ownership in the terms of John Locke. Because uh, in Je uh, John Locke, um, I, I never understood what it means, the self I own. It, it's not the body, it's not the spirit, uh, it's not the, 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 the labor force, uh, what actually it is, it is uh, the creation being created by God, actually. Yeah. And it's a very theological uh, uh, approach. Uh, but as Fakundo uh, quotes uh, from Mundrisse uh, in this um, um, commune which precedes capitalist economy, the worker owns the labor. The labor is the property of uh, workers. 
master in this sense, which is not a self-ownership concept. I use the term that Earth nature owns its resources. In the same sense as workers are owners of uh, their labor. And Gia, do you mind that we discuss your question? <laughs> well, I thought it might be interesting for you. Yeah, yeah, no, but, but this is really... But I mean, isn't this is Medina's question leading yeah. to the, I mean, very radical idea that even if you claim it, I very much like the imminence of your yeah. concept here, but, um, well, conceptually, but, and, and, and then you claim that this is imminent to our understanding of property, yeah. to our property rights. Yeah. But maybe it's not imminent, maybe it, it, it still I mean, transforms yeah. and would blow up, yeah. blow, blow up capitally. Yeah, maybe it's, it's consistent with yeah. property rights yeah. in a certain understanding. Yeah. This is a, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> a very, very old yeah. thing, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. maybe not dynamic for capitalism. This is the best answer you can, you can give to yeah. this question. Yeah. 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 It starts like, uh, okay, let's talk about what we have. But we have certain property rights. Uh, and we have the practices of the rights of nature. But we end up uh, uh, a very, very different uh, uh, concept of society without any private ownership uh, in certain ways. But if you start with, with this claim, uh, you lose a lot of readers. So. Okay, thank you all for coming and we have to come to an end. Thank you. Thank you.